one. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, very glad to break the ice. Uh, I hope uh, you guys are charged up. I will have uh, uh, um, a lecture which is uh, probably one of the least technical ones to set the uh, The idea of my introductory lecture will be to uh, communicate to you the world enthusiasm for quantum computing and to um, help you navigate a bit the landscape of the stakeholders and the opportunities for uh, participating in this big uh, uh, adventure, which is not only intellectual in nature, is also an industrial uh, revolution, or at least an attempt to an industrial revolution. And, and so I thought it was appropriate to set the stage by uh, overviewing the uh, quantum computing landscape in terms of hardware architectures and opportunities to use quantum computers today uh, with the understanding that most of the remaining part of the school will be instead uh, uh, deeping, uh, uh, a deep dive into methods and uh, some of the methods will not be uh, sufficiently um, uh, appropriate for current existing quantum computers or prototypes which are coming up, but at least you will have a, a chance to understand what's missing between what we have now and what is required to simulate uh, field theories or condensed matter systems in, in general. So my name is David Venturelli. I'm, uh, um, I'm here a representation of uh, NASA, the Space Agency, which is uh, 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 actually a partner of the uh, Superconducting Quantum uh, Material and System Center, which is a sponsor of the school. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this as part of my overview. You can reach me at this email officially, but while I'm in Italy, I'm not allowed to actually <laughs> check that email. So uh, you should have an email, uh, which is usra.edu, which is on the website of the school to reach out. But I'll be around here. I'm uh, room 104 while uh, I'm staying uh, this week. My outline, we're going to go and discuss a bit the history of quantum technologies and recapping some concepts uh, which are useful for the rest of the school with the understanding that most of the speakers try to, to make their lectures as self-contained as possible, but there are some dependencies between lectures. So don't skip if you can. Uh, and, uh, and then we will go and discuss few architectures uh, of quantum computers, which are specifically uh, usable today to do quantum simulations. They're not necessarily the best computers uh, that will be available in a few years, but they are the ones that are usable today. Uh, and, and then I'll conclude with some uh, resources, snapshots of uh, the rest of the course and few other uh, informations. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. The idea of this lecture is also to, you know, uh, be a little bit more acquainted to each other. So, uh, let's be as informal as possible. Let's start with a brief history. Now, um, this is more like a buzzword, but we are in something that sometimes the uh, reporters, the the you know the magazines, the the, the blogs talk about uh, and refer to the second quantum revolution. What does that mean? Well, it means that quantum mechanics was discovered. You've seen pictures of, uh, you know, the big protagonists uh, really in these uh, places that uh, have uh, discovered important principles of quantum mechanics. But it was discovered at the beginning of the, the first part of the 1900. And that's the first quantum revolution, the understanding of quantum mechanics. Now, what happened during the second half of that century is uh, that uh, quantum mechanics was formalized, was made operational, was verified. And then uh, people have started to couple the concepts of physics discovered by quantum mechanical uh, experiments and so on with the concepts of information science. And uh, uh, that's somewhat the birth of quantum information science with the first algorithms, with the first ideas on how to do quantum metrology, how to do quantum communication. And indeed, at the, in the 90s, there was a first 
big world enthusiasm about quantum computing, specifically because of the discovery of some algorithm that will be reviewed today uh, but uh, or tomorrow, but um, which made everyone excited because it was clear that quantum computers were qualitatively different than digital computers and some operations were uh, made uh, uh, accelerated in a way that no classical processor would ever be able to match, at least asymptotically. And, and then what happened in about 2007, roughly, is that um, the second quantum revolution started because technology, nanotechnology, quantum control, electronics, ability to filter signals and process uh, AI um, was sufficient to have the first qubits, which were, you know, they didn't suck, essentially. Okay, so that they were able to be engineered and controllable and that they were able to be coupled. And, and this started um, another, you know, uh, big uh, uh, enthusiasm which wasn't realized fully until the early 2010, 2012, 13, when the world realized that if you really want to build a quantum computer, now you can, or at least we think so. Meaning that we have enough to invest billions of dollars and try to create this big device, which has a lot of requirements. And this is the second quantum revolution is the applied use of quantum mechanics for either information processing, information acquisition, transmission, or transduction. So quantum technologies span communication, sensing, metrology, but computing is big protagonist because it, it overlaps almost all other technologies. Now, another very important word, and the one which is the most central of my lecture today is this acronym NISC. Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum System. It was coined by a professor, a very well-known professor named John Preskill in a conference called Quantum for Business. They exist uh, in 2018, I think, or 17, I think it was 18. Uh, and uh, that's essentially the period of time where we can build quantum computers, but they're quite far away from the paper, pen and paper version of how we would describe them on the Nielsen and Chuang or in any other textbook, because they have imperfections, which are, you know, they need to be modeled. We're not really sure how they play out. They would be cross stocks or, you know, uh, the value of a parameter is shifted by an unknown, you know, stochastic error, you know, they're noisy. And, uh, uh, but still they're quantum. And so the game that we play in this moment of, of, of development of technology is to try to use those devices to achieve stunts of quantum superiority. Like for example, we want to make them um, controllable enough so that we can compute something. It doesn't have to be useful. It could be like a combinatorial puzzle made up exactly for that purpose, but something that would not be able to be computed in any other way. And then we can claim quantum supremacy. That, what happened, for example, with their experiment of Google a couple of years ago, and more recently with Gaussian boson sampling and the likes. Um, and of course, there is a big quest from industry and startups and uh, you know motivated individuals to achieve quantum advantage, which means doing something useful with a quantum computer, which is actually better if you use a quantum computer, then if you don't use a quantum computer. We're not there yet really accepting quantum simulation. There are some signatures and I'll review a few things that uh, show that there are some models whose dynamics or with thermodynamics is simulated more efficiently with a quantum device right now than with a, with a supercomputer, for example. And of course, in this moment of time in technology, what we want is to set the foundation, gain the insights, understand the principles of engineering that will bring us to a moment where this device will be less noisy and where they will actually act like we want them to act. And this sometimes is called the fault tolerant era of quantum computing. We don't know when it starts. It could be next year, probably not. Could be in five years, in three years, in two years, in seven, in 15, and never. There are some skeptical skeptics out there. Some of them are actually pretty 
you know, uh, renowned individuals, okay? So it's not only, you know, crazy people on the street. There are some people that have uh, some serious objection that our error correction is not really all worked out. But it seems that the experiments that we have so far shows that, um, you know, it seems to work. So uh, right now we are here and what I'm gonna discuss is really what's happening in this moment of time where we have NISC devices. Now, if we zoom in in this moment of time, we see that there are many attempts to create quantum computers with many different technology uh, uh, stacks. Now, this is an infographic from Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, you can Google it, uh, so you don't, don't try to read uh, all the super tiny uh, um, names, but it kind of gives you a sense Every little slice of this pie is a serious project where there are multiple you know, universities or companies trying to create a quantum computer with that specific little thing. And um, they are divided in macro technology stacks. You have a superconducting, trapped ion, photonic, spin quantum dot, cold neutral, helium atom, um, NV centers in diamonds, in adiabatic annealing, and, and topological. So, and each one of them has different flavors. Now, wh why there are so many methods to create quantum computers? Well, because everything is quantum, okay? Like something is sufficiently cold or small or protected from the outside world behave quantum mechanically. And so the question is though, can we engineer things around that little thing? Because I can take this bottle and make it quantum, but can't make a quantum computer with it. And, and people are trying to do things uh, with different technologies. And we're gonna review some of them, the ones that have shown more promise in this moment of time, but they're not necessarily the one that are more scalable for the fault tolerant era. And I will navigate some logos of companies because that's a little bit uh, uh, how you know what are the products out there. And I just want to, uh, this is a, an arrangement which is a completely arbitrary and personal. It, it doesn't reflect uh, necessarily reality. I, I tried to put product maturity on the line and full tolerance focus on the other, but this really shifts by the day. And the product maturity just simply means like, since how many years the company has been trying to do things or uh, you know, how many uh, millions of dollars have been invested, something like that. And we're going to go and discuss some of them. Now, also another thing to know in this moment of time, uh, algorithms are typically uh, categorized in, uh, in three big macro areas. And uh, uh, I want to discuss them briefly, just as an orientation. The um, macro area number one is quantum simulation, which is the one which motivated the existence of this school. The question of the quantum simulation is, can we use a quantum computer, QPU means quantum processing unit, uh, as a programmable experiment. So we use quantum mechanics to simulate or emulate quantum mechanics. And, and, and then we, we can measure this experiment, which we program to, to, to emulate something else, uh, fast, uh, can we measure this and obtain information fast and what we would have done by solving the Schrodinger equation or the Limbaugh equation, whatever, on an uh, high performance computer. And the methods that, uh, in my view, are uh, you know, viable today to do this are uh, analog simulators, I'll discuss them a bit, and then variational methods such as the ones that will be discussed in a few lectures. Um, there are also other methods which will be reviewed during the school, but they're not still very implementable in current computers because they have high requirements. Now, um, of course, if you're trying to re retrieve information which uh, belongs to a quantum system, the fidelity of your operation is particularly important because the statistics you're trying to emulate or collect uh, information on is quantum in nature. So you really need to try to represent your Hamiltonians, your dynamics as accurately as possible. Now, another field uh, of research is quantum machine learning. You will have a lecture on Friday on this. And uh, um, 
the question of quantum machine learning somewhat is, can we run a quantum neural network, which is capable to learn patterns or distributions better than classical deep learning, for example? There are methods which are viable today. Some of them will be reviewed in the lecture. Uh, quantum machine learning, it's a little bit of a moving target also because the metrics of success of machine learning are a little bit arbitrary. So, you know, it's difficult to understand quantum advantage in a very strong and rigorous terms. but there are some interesting results uh, recently that are formally uh, demonstrating speed up although they are mostly on processing quantum data. So you need actually to transduct the data to be quantum and that might be a little bit uh, incurring overheads. It's unclear whether fidelity is uh, very important for quantum machine learning to work, but uh, uh, definitely um, people are trying to understand that. Now there's another field which is quantum optimization. We were, we're not going to cover quantum optimization in this school. However, uh, me and Soaib and others are working in quantum optimizations. If you're interested there, you can just, you know, reach out and chat about this. The question of quantum optimization is, can we map a classical combinatorial problem, for example, traveling salesman or uh, Sudoku, whatever, you know, into um, essentially a cooling process or some sort of a, a, a energy exchange for which you can map the state of your quantum system to the solution at the end of some sort of evolution to the solution of your mathematical problem. But uh, the question is, uh, is there more a problem in specifying advantage in quantum machine learning versus optimization? I believe so. In optimization, you have a cost function. The cost function gives you a natural score of the quality of your solution. So you sometimes do not know the value of the optimal uh, solution. So you don't know how, how high the co cost function or low the cost function or the objective function can be, but you can still you know, measure uh, apple to apple by using two methods you know, that try to solve the same problem. What is the quality and compare their time to solution and so on. But in machine learning, since you're trying to emulate, for example, a generative model, you're trying to emulate how well you represent the target distribution. Sometimes you don't know the target distribution. You don't know really whether your method is, is, is providing you better inference, for example, and the others. And um, uh, I, I, I am not uh, um, active research in quantum machine learning right now, but uh, I believe that during the lecture of quantum machine learning, or you can reach out to Andrea, which is uh, here, uh, um, she can tell you some metrics that are used there to, to compare the performance of algorithms. Is quantum advantage the right goal for quantum machine learning? Anyone has an opinion on that? Okay. I get it, yeah, sorry. As a random comment, I was reading the title, is quantum advantage the right goal for quantum machine learning where they explain why it may not be the right goal uh, because the problems that are studied in quantum computing are typically very different than the problems that are solved by machine learning. I mean, so, um, but anyway, it's just a random comment also. Oh, I mean, I would find quantum advantage in a, in a slide or so, but, um, okay, I didn't read the paper, but. Uh, I, like you, you shouldn't really compare it to um, how classical computers use machine learning to do, you know, stuff like image recognition and so forth, because quantum computers might actually be better at handling quantum data. Um, and maybe that's what you should try to apply quantum machine learning to. Um, whereas if you try to encode classical data into a quantum register, 
and then try to do something computational with it. It's very unclear if that can actually lead to an advantage and whether that's a sensible thing to do. I haven't read that paper extensively either, Peter, but you know, I think that's that's like a folk kind of you know uh, sentiment that's often shared, I guess, in QML. Okay. Um, there are other algorithms that are useful in general to be designed for quantum computing, but they're also viable somewhat in the NISC era. And uh, um, those are like, for example, randomness generation that could be used for cryptography or verification of randomness, um, linear algebra speed ups, so matrix multiplications and the likes. There's some attempt to solve uh, differential equations with the algorithms that are viable in the near term, and also to encode data structures and to perform tests of quantumness or foundational um, physics uh, experiments uh, through algorithms. Some of these things will be touched upon by speakers during the school, but they're not a focus uh, as far as I understand. Yes, those are the speakers that will touch some of those uh, uh, um, topics. So you can catch them at the, at the coffee. Uh, uh, yeah, we have a coffee machine there. So here you are. Okay, so continuing the big picture again, uh, the enthusiasm is unprecedented on quantum computing despite the little bumps of the enthusiasm meter in, in, the early, in the late 90s and in the early 2000s. This is really something that they've never seen before in quantum computing. We have more than $30 billion invested by the public sector, so grants and government programs worldwide to build quantum computers. Okay, this is a graph from Kureka. It's a nice uh, website uh, where you can find a lot of information about the ecosystem of quantum computing. And since we are in Europe, I wanted to highlight a couple of things about what's going on in Europe right now. There is a quantum flagship. Now the European Commission defines only very few things as flagships projects. Quantum is one of them. Okay, whether it was the genome, the connectome project, this is one of them. So they're very committed to fund quantum technologies, there is a consortium of uh, entities that uh, discuss you know, quantum roadmaps and all it's called QUIC. European Innovation Council is putting calls continuously for startups or for other consortium of universities to team up to advance quantum computing. And in Italy, and this is a news of the 19th of July, so really a few days ago, Fine. Well, but then the government fell, so I don't know what's happening, but <laughs> yes, in theory, there's been a deployment, uh, a commitment for more than 300 million in, um, well, around the activities in the University of Bologna, but will be spread all over. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the Italian professors here know much more than what I know from the websites about what's going on here. So it's interesting for you to know these things because as career-wise, you want to be where there's a lot of attention and funding. Now, I represent uh, uh, NASA, which is a US government agency, and SQMS is an important US government investment. So I want to just let you know what's going on in the United States. The United States, it's an interesting country, okay? I've been there since 10 years. I'm Italian originally. Now I'm also an American citizen. And the States, when they do things seriously, in my view, you know, they, they move mountains. And uh, they have quantum.gov, which beside having a very cool logo and it's a website, you, go, you know, really coordinates and accentuates a lot of resources for government funding in quantum. And agencies such as DARPA, the Department of Energy, the NSF, IARPA, have put more than $1 billion in quantum uh, through the so-called quantum National Quantum Initiative. And then there are other, uh, at least three agencies which have like, committed more than 10 people, uh, full-time people, person, staff, uh, you know, uh, groups doing quantum computing uh, research. And NASA is one of them. There's the Air Force and the Navy. And there's also a consortium of, uh, um, of uh, companies which uh, uh, try to develop the supply chain of quantum technologies called the QEDC. 
and uh, uh, it's uh, somewhat sponsored and in collaboration with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So those are the agencies which are really committed to, to make things work. I want to zoom in on some centers which might be target of your job applications if you're uh, you know, a quantum simulation person. The National Science Foundation, which sponsors academia in the United States, have made uh, uh, five, um, have, have invested $25 million each for creation of five centers in the United States. Two of them are pretty heavily into quantum simulation. So one is in Berkeley, California, one is University of Maryland, but they are also having satellite collaborations and they are, one is the Challenging Institute for Quantum Computation, the other the Institute for Robust Quantum Simulation. So I invite you to, you know, have a look what's going on there. There are powerhouses of activities with very prominent researchers. And they're working on all sorts of uh, technologies and approaches that you will learn during the school. And of course, there's also the investment of the Department of Energy, which made the school possible. There are five centers in the United States, which are focused around government laboratories, which traditionally work for the Department of Energy. They are uh, specialized in uh, uh, covering uh, specific topics. We are representation, in representation of uh, SQMS. And on Wednesday, you will get an introduction of what we're doing at SQMS. And, but basically the, the tagline is, we're studying the problem of decoherence in superconductors. And we're building a new type of quantum computer and developing quantum sensor based on superconducting technologies. Okay. There are other four, and uh, all of them are uh, very interesting destinations for research. Okay, enough a little bit with the, uh, um, with the big picture. I will go a little bit more into the uh, details of uh, uh, the status of technology. But before that, I want to tell you, in this moment of time, which is the NISC era, it's very important to ask the right questions, okay? These computers are not really very powerful right now. So we want to use them wisely and we want to make sure that we learn something every time we, we, uh, we use them. Otherwise we do just busy work. And I think it's very inspirational to see what DARPA is doing because they, DARPA, has the culture, DARPA is the defense uh, uh, agency for advanced projects uh, for the Department of Defense, but it's typically you know, a big uh, promoter of technology innovation. The internet exists because of DARPA. And, uh, um, and I think it's very inst instructive to look at what are the programs of DARPA because they ask in my view the, the right questions. For example, there's a program where I'm personally heavily involved, which is uh, trying to ask the question whether you can uh, actually deliver quantum advantage with devices which are noisy in optimization. That's an important question. Nobody knows whether it's really possible or not uh, with current devices to get quantum advantage. It's another program which uh, tries to understand whether quantum annealing, which is a specific technology, we're not gonna cover it in this school, but it's a, technology which is viable today to have thousands of qubits, whether that technology can uh, deliver quantum advantage for machine learning, for example, or what are their fundamental limits of, of, of this uh, approach. There is a new program, which is called quantum benchmarking, uh, where we're trying to estimate the utility of quantum computers, utility in uh, like dollar value, again, like, the, very practical questions in whether it, is it worth to run a quantum computer which is you know fully fledged full tolerant and so on there's a new program which is about to start which is called under the explore system for utility scale quantum computing which is trying to identify things which didn't get as much funding and others because of historical reasons but they have peculiarities that are uh, useful for uh, breakthroughs and then there's also a program on uh, quantum inspired computing. That's another buzzword you will find. Quantum inspired uh, computing is essentially physics based methods, which have some historical or aesthetical resemblance to quantum computing, 
which are used for, uh, for uh, typically optimization, but not only. So neuromorphic, it's a little bit in that direction. There is a, a simulated annealing or a parallel tempering. There is the coherentizing machines, which are uh, photonic devices, uh, which uh, try to uh, you know, achieve optimization uh, of combinatorial problems through physics-based methods, typically analog. What is the hope that we have in this period of time? Well, I mean, this is more my view, but I think it's pretty reflective of the status of the art. Please. The question is, is neuromorphic computing popular in the US? Is it something that uh, comes up a lot? Um, Compared to quantum computing, there's a factor of 100, uh, as far as I understand. Uh, I'm not in the neuromorphic community, but I am familiar with, uh, for example, the two biggest industrial attempts to create um, neuromorphic chips. One is by IBM with the True North chip. One is by Intel with the Lohi chip. Then there are other you know, projects, just Pinnacker and so on. Spike in neural networks are getting traction because the, you do have some advantage in energy uh, consumption, which is pr which are pretty clear, but the uh, learning and inference capabilities of these uh, architectures are typically not as easily um, uh, showing performance as the traditional deep learning based on GPUs uh, uh, architectures. So as far as I know, the they, there's a lot of people which are watching the space, but there, I've never seen like such a big enthusiasm. Now, quantum neuromorphic is also a subfield of like maybe 20 researchers worldwide <laughs> that are going in that direction where they're trying to uh, do spike in neural networks essentially through, um, through quantum circuits or quantum devices, memory stores and the likes. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a underexplored field. I would uh, I would consider that an underexplored field. Anyone has a different perspective on neuromorphism? Because I'm a, I'm a tourist of the field, so. Well, the hope that I have and many of my colleagues have during this moment of time, where we cannot deploy the algorithm for which we can prove mathematically that there is a speed up, is that quantum advantage, speed up, ability to do things which are intractable will be determined empirically rather than identified theoretically beforehand. Because we're working with noise device, sometimes you cannot model the noise. You can, you know, you can just limitly, limitedly understanding what you're doing. We hope that a little bit like in machine learning in deep learning, you will achieve uh, through trial and error, error some signature of quantum advantage. Of course, this is not really completely a blind search. Okay, we, we, we're guided by simulations and other sort of principles, but definitely we're not guided by hard proofs of, uh, of performance uh, for most of the algorithms which are employed in the NISCARA. And typically what you will see if you scan the literature is a like a, a framework like this. Uh, you, you try something, you know, it's quantum is, uh, you know, well thought of, then you try it. And then you ask yourself, well, did I do better than some other thing that I could have done? Like, doesn't have to be the best thing, it's just the, some other things. In optimization, you know, you can even ask even better than random, random guessing, okay, for example, okay. Well, if, you, if you're not better, you typically don't even publish, you know, you just uh, do a blog post to say, I tried this on Stack Exchange, it doesn't work. Sometimes you publish, but <laughs> I don't advise you to. Uh, if you do instead beat something, well, there's a buzzword for that. You achieve some sort of limited quantum speed up or limited quantum advantage. You just simply say, well, my algorithm is better than simulated annealing on that problem or whatever it is. I'm talking about optimization as an example, but if you're a simulation, I suppose you can, you can, you can find something similar. Now, then you can ask yourself, okay, but what if I put like 
seven PhDs and two postdocs to work on this for a year, okay? I, you know, or, or what if I just read all the papers on the problem and I use all the techniques which have been developed so far? Uh, do I beat everything that, you know, is known to be good? Well, if you do, you have what is called quantum advantage. That's the requirement for industry, essentially, okay? You need to do something which is better than what we have. Otherwise, nobody will buy it, except university research, okay? So that's what everybody's trying to do, to find something where you're better. And the jury's still out for a lot of things uh, uh, out there. And of course, you can ask yourself, well, now that I beat all the known literature, is it even conceivable that somebody will beat my computer without quantum mechanics? I mean, assuming that the pillars of computer science don't shatter, right? Uh, quantum mechanics is valid. If uh, the answer is no, then you have quantum supremacy, meaning that you have simulated or solved something that is not going to be impossible without the use of the power of quantum mechanics. So those are the buzzwords to know. End of my history, big recap. Uh, ecosystem speech. Uh, if you have any other question, you can ask me now or later. We have a question and answer every every um, every day. I'm going to move on on uh, some more technical aspects of quantum computing. Okay. So this school is not for total beginners. We assume that. Some of the things that you will be presented, uh, you, you will see are not the first time you see them, okay? So I have a little test here, okay? A few things that, you know, you will see and maybe I suppose the lecturer will tell you what they are, but I assume that it's not the first time you see them. So what's the first thing at the top, uh, uh, top left? This, uh, this, this, you know, some of, of four, four things. Anyone has an idea what that could be? Huh? Superposition. Superposition is uh, two qubits in superposition, okay? Bracket notation, simple, okay? Uh, gen yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, if the coefficients are not, uh, you know, uh, having some symmetries, this is an entangled state. I hope I'm not saying things that, you know, shock you. Okay, good. Uh, second thing, what's this nice ball? Block sphere. Yes, block sphere, just like a visual representation of a qubit. I suppose that I've seen some slides, they use it, so I just wanted to show you. Uh, I suppose, you, like, if you don't know these things, it's fine, totally. A lot of people you come from mathematics, from, I don't know, uh, high energy physics, uh, uh, and maybe they didn't have a lot of quantum computer backgrounds. Just, you know, ask us something to read. There's a lot of tutorials now that there are startups like that. So, you know, I can give you a lot of things you can read tonight and get up to speed, maybe. What if, what? For the what? The two qubits. <laughs> Anyone know why didn't uh, didn't draw the block sphere for two qubits? Well, besides the fact that there are generalizations for two qubits of block sphere, right? Which I don't remember. It's not very standard, but but uh, yeah, uh, you you cannot you know. So how many how many real numbers you need to describe the register of n qubits? Anyone knows? Yeah, this is the norm. That was the trick, uh, trick question. Yeah, of course. Yes, so exponential number. So you cannot really draw it on a sphere unless you're uh, living and seeing multiple dimensions. Okay, so these are matrices or symbols. What is this? It's the same as this. 
C naught gate. Okay. What is this? Anyone knows this gate? Is is an X Y gate? Now gate notation is you know matrix notation where the canonical you know ordering is assumed. Yes, I, I'm just uh, you know I know you know these things, but just want to make sure. What is the thing on the top right, for example? You don't have to really. It's an Hamiltonian. An Hamiltonian. We don't know if it's a boson or permians. Second quantization, I think you should kind of know for this course. So if you don't know, I'll give you some pointers, but those are, you know, operators that are in cycle quantization. What is this thing? Huh? Rotating wave. Rotating wave. Mm, it could be, possibly. I mean, there could be something. Yes, it's a time evolution. It's a time evolution for uh, the Schrodinger equation, essentially, if you have a time dependent interaction, Hamiltonian something. Now, what if it is not time dependent? What would it be? Not, not answer all questions. <laughs> okay, yes, it would be the exponential of uh, um, minus i h t. You will see those things in the next lectures and so on. What is this thing? Reduced density matrix. So for a few on Thursday, we will have lectures on error mitigation. So we'll need to go into the open system world. You might be also, you know, um, certainly be uh, happy if you know also limb blood evolution, but it's not necessary. But at least the formalism of uh, density matrices is important for some of the lectures. Okay, that was the only test in my in my little expose. Let's move on. Okay, this is a super basic recap. Next lecture is algorithm one, so they will tell you these things much better than me. But just to set the thing straight, quantum mechanics in quantum computing is essentially a combination of two things, evolution and measurement, coherent evolution and measurements. Quantum program is the execution of these operations uh, usually in terms of gates, because you cannot write down the evolution of the entire system is exponentially large. So you need to break it down into components, typically gates, not necessarily only gates, could be an analog evolution of multiple gates, but you need to be able to, to decompose it in such a way that is, uh, you know, tractable for execution in a, in a quantum computer. And a quantum gate is unitary operation. One important thing I wanted to, um, to say about quantum computing, especially for implementation of quantum computing, is that typically you have these circuits which are beautiful and you will see a lot of them during the lectures, which are, you know, your, uh, they're typically a space-time diagram where time goes in one direction and you start with qubits initialized somewhere and then you have these gates which entangle the qubits. You cannot write anymore the wave function as you go on. And then at the end you measure. Sometimes you can measure in the middle as well. That's essentially, those are idealized circuits, okay? Those are things which are hardware agnostic. But now when you have hardware, you have at least two things to worry about. One is synthesis. Your full you know, evolution, your full Schrodinger equation needs to be, as I mentioned, broken down into operations which are implementable as native, um, uh, instructions in your architecture that you're running. So that's a big problem. We're going to discuss it for a second. Then a second problem is more an optimization problem, but it could be a big overhead, which is uh, uh, once you broke down your uh, quantum algorithm in the native instruction set of your processor, you still need to compile, meaning that you need to make sure that this is executed as efficiently as possible. Uh, by, by looking at the constraints of the architecture. And now that I'm gonna review some architecture, you'll understand a little bit the flavor of these two things. But let's go in giving you some examples. One is the synthesis example. Uh, it's an important result, which is very relevant for superconducting architectures. If you have single qubit rotations, 
on the X, Y, or Z direction. Those are the single uh, qubit rotation matrices. And then you have C naught. You do have what's called a universal set of gates, which allows you to do any two qubit gate. Now, any two qubit gate could be written as the exponential of these uh, essential interactions here. And there is a known optimal decomposition of any gate written in that form as part of maximum three C naughts and a certain number of gates, which are uh, depending on whether you're trying to do something simple or something uh, more complicated. And typically, so that, that's, that kind of gives you a, a bound on the maximum complexity of executing a gate if you have access to this set of uh, native operation, which is typical for superconducting systems, but is not necessarily typical for other systems. But usually, I mean, not usually, but often uh, people demonstrate universality by mapping things to C naught and then using this sort of results. Okay, so once you have, uh, there are other more even elegant theorems that don't require parametrized gates with the uh, angles, but let's stick to those th things for the NISCARA, which is uh, what typically is used. So this is an example of synthesis. Now an example of compilation, just to give you an idea. There was a question. Okay. Now, Usually when you look at a circuit, you essentially see that, that qubits needs to interact in pairs because two qubit gates typically are used. So there are pairs and edges. So suppose for example, that you look at your algorithm and you know that you need to schedule, you need to execute gates between the, the qubits which are described in this graph. And very often you will see in uh, variational algorithms, the order doesn't really matter, like, you know, you could decide to execute a specific gate before another. Not that they commute, but the order doesn't matter. Sometimes they commute, sometimes they're not. Now, the problem is these qubits lie on a, on a chip sometimes, if it is a solid state architecture or, or in some other substrate. And so it's not for granted that you do have interactions between that pair freely available in your architecture. So you need to figure out how to place the initial qubit and assign them to the physical locations in the chip, and also how to move around information so that you can schedule this little, uh, this little algorithm. So this is an example where, for example, qubit one needs to interact with qubit five, three, and four, right? But if you locate it on this square, which is your chip, you know, one, four, three, and five this way, you see that one and four, they can execute easily, but one and three, no, because three is one step away. So you need to move three close to one, and then you can execute one and three. But then five needs to be moved as well. And then you need to swap, for example, one and three, and then execute something, sorry guys, uh, between one and five. Why do you need to swap and you cannot, for example, copy the information? No one knows? No cloning, yes. You, cannot, you can only do reversible operations, okay? So swap is a gate, it's typically it's like that. A lot of the architectures that we will see and you can use today require this sort of game, which is terribly costly. So you can try to avoid it for many algorithms. And then you have this sort of schedules that uh, you know, needs to be as compact as possible to execute. It's a Gantt chart for the business people in the world you know, um, that decides at any given time what gates are operating essentially. Okay. And uh, oh, so still on compilation just to know, you know, in the worst case scenario, you want all the qubits to interact with everyone else. That happens in a lot of algorithms. In the worst case scenario, you need to implement a swap network. And the swap network uh, in this, you know, um, in the most parallelizable case, it gives you an overhead 
of n steps because you need to do some sort of round robin tournament all the time between pairs and make sure that everyone arrives to interact with the farther away. And uh, being scheduled on a line, it's the same as being scheduled essentially in, uh, um, on a 2D graph or even non planar graph because you need to schedule all the n times n minus one divided by two gates. So the overhead of compilation is really important in uh, current architectures. Okay, so now that you have this, uh, oh, people, people on the chat were also answering the questions. Thank you guys. I'll try to, to look sometimes. So now let's go and review some of the architectures that you can use today. Starting with, well, a disclaimer. I already made it, but just to make sure, we're not gonna look at computers which are not available today through some sort of cloud service or some vendor that you can pay for. There are others which are, you know, very good and very cool and extremely well-funded, but they're not available. So I don't know them very well or, you know, um, so they're not part of this presentation. So this is uh, incomplete. Starting with the superconducting. Now, uh, these are two tutorials you can go and, and check for having the physics detail. But one of the most important architecture that uh, is viable today is based on superconducting transmons. Those are circuits which are um, cooled down to very low temperature, millikelvin usually. And uh, um, essentially, they are based on intuition that if you have an LC circuit and you cool it down very, uh, very low temperature where the quantum effects uh, dominate versus the thermal uh, broadenings and so forth, it behaves like an harmonic oscillator. But if you use a nonlinear element in the circuits, such as a Josephson junction, which is an effect that happens in superconductors when you create a tunnel uh, junction between two parts of a, of a superconductor, um, you have the ability to make your harmonic oscillator unharmonic. And you have the ability to essentially have energy levels, which are non-degenerate, which seems to be a requirement for quantum control. If you assign the computational value zero to the ground state of your anharmonic oscillator, which is just a circuit cooled down, as I mentioned before, uh, and the first uh, um, excited states, the computational value one, you have an energy, um, difference, which is a, a frequency that you can access uh, through uh, essentially microwaves that you can uh, uh, use to drive the evolution of the system without uh, uh, affecting the other levels. Because if it was a, a fully uh, harmonic oscillator, you would not know where you will end up because you have you know, a ladder of degenerate um, uh, transitions. And so the transmons are an example of a circuit that allows you to have some control over two levels of a well-defined engineering system. And it's a very popular architecture because you can couple transmons easily, either capacitively or uh, through inductance, uh, and, do, and then creating essentially Hamiltonians of two-level systems and interaction of two-level systems. There are other uh, kind of uh, uh, circuits such as Fuxonium where you don't shunt with a, with a capacitance, but you shunt with a, um, an inductance, but those are more difficult to couple, for example. So they're not as popular despite having advantages in some other directions. Uh, so these are, these are uh, the basic components of a lot of processors that are used and deployed in industry today. For example, the big three, when I say big, I mean pub public funded companies, okay? There are other companies which are, you know, uh, or university groups that are, you know, having big uh, and, and very performant uh, chips, but those are the three 
which are uh, publicly funded in the United States. I don't know China, but those are the three available on the cloud. So IBM has a circuit that now 127 qubits. Uh, they declare a roadmap to get to 400 very soon and soon 1000. And the, this is the layout where uh, the, the transmos are coupled nearest neighbors. And the gates you can do through the nearest neighbors are control X, our identity, our rotations on single qubits in the Z direction on an arbitrary angle, and then uh, a square root of X and uh, X, the poly X matrix matrices. Um, of course, if you want to interact a qubit from here to there, you need to swap things around. Otherwise, you cannot do it. Brigetti is a partner of SQMS. Uh, so uh, is an important uh, architecture for at least our center at Fermilab. Uh, currently they have 80 qubits in their M1 chips. Again, they are also, oh, I'm sorry. Their roadmap is not that one. I did copy pasted wrongly from IBM. The roadmap is different. I'm not sure what the roadmap is, but, uh, or, or if I am, I'm not, no, I'm not sure what has been disclosed, but it's not very far away from the one of IBM, okay? Um, and uh, um, they did focus on, uh, on developing gates, which are uh, parameterized as native operation, meaning that they depend on real numbers, angles, so it's a unitary, so we can call it an angle because it's a unitary can be described in exponential or something. But uh, so for example, the C phase gate, which has this angle here for the one one state or the XY gate that I showed before are natively implemented in the chip, which has this nice octagonal interaction structure. Then you have Google, which has released the chip with 72 qubits, but only 53 are kind of working. And this is common. I mean, the, people say it's 127, but most of the literature, you will see people using 10, 12, 15, 50 because they choose the best uh, in, in the chip, even if the chip is large. Um, now, um, Google has a, a Sycamore chip. The roadmap is not really in the number of qubits. They want to get to a logical qubit. So they're pretty focused towards the full tolerance uh, um, objectives and milestones. And they have as native operations, some uh, gates, which is similar somewhat to the XY gate, depend on two angles. It's called the Sycamore gate or uh, FSIM. Yes. I don't think they released the roadmap, right? Oh, the question is, what's the roadmap for the fidelities? I don't think they released the really roadmaps. They're more like bragging when they achieve some extra, uh, you know, values. But uh, I know that everybody wants ninety nine point nine. Uh, and they all say it's coming. They they do report uh, sometimes in the specs. When you go online, you can see the fidelity for each uh, gate. But then in their press releases, they don't overemphasize their fidelity. And sometimes it's um, more the mean fidelity or the best in the chip, you know. So. Yes, for simulation, certainly it's very important. And um, yes, I, I, I believe, so uh, I don't know if uh, online was heard, but uh, Hank was saying that uh, indeed uh, some, Sometimes people look um, look uh, at the um, quantum volume, which is a, a fidelity test for a random circuit that is run, which is as deep as wide, like is a square kind of uh, you know certain number of operations times a certain number of qubits. But and then there are volumetric generalization of that. Um, but uh, yes, there's no big attention from the press releases on the fidelities typically is more in the number of qubits, which is as Peter pointed out, maybe not the best. Uh, 
uh, approach. And Valerie online asks, what's the code and distance used for Google's one logical qubit? I don't think Google has one logical qubit really yet. They did demonstrate though a code distance five, if I well remember, I don't know if any of you knows more, but yes, there was the Google symposium just last week. The, the, the talks are on YouTube. They reviewed their, their paper. Uh, uh, they, they did show that uh, surface code distance three and a surface code distance five, uh, uh, they, they do see an increase in, uh, in, uh, in uh, fidelity by using a distance five versus a distance three. There will be a lecture on error correction by Ryan LaRose on Thursday, I think. Uh, so please grill him on these sorts of things. So question is, planar chips like these ones, they require swap gate for most algorithms. As we have seen, this is a quadratic overhead. Uh, does this mean that this swamps the quadratic speed up of Grover algorithms or other sorts of things? And so we need to look at architectures which are having not this kind of overhead. Um, well, first of all, the quadratic overhead uh, is in the number of gates, not necessarily in the length of the algorithm because you can parallelize. It could be a linear overhead in execution time if you can have full parallelization. Okay, so that could, you know, uh, help you. Um, but I just say, as, at least in optimization, it's kind of a consensus that quadratic speed up is not gonna make it, meaning that it's not going to be sufficiently motivating for quantum advantage to be real, not even in the Niskera, more likely than not. So people are hoping at least quartic speed up if you're you know, trying to look at the algorithm. There are very few algorithms which have been invented where you can prove what a quartic speed up or exponential speed up. It doesn't mean that you turn an exponential problem into a polynomial one. You can turn like a two to the power of n into e square root of n, something like this, which would still be much nicer. It's a super polynomial speed up. Now, this kind of speed up has never been proved as far as I know, except in very symmetric pathological things in quantum annealing. Uh, but uh, there's some sort of hope in my community that empirically speaking for the median case and not the worst case, you can get this sort of speed up. And in quantum inspired algorithms that are already right now, algorithms that uh, was worst case, no, sorry, was median case for spin glasses uh, scales as e to the square root of n, for example, but not on quantum algorithm as far as I know. Okay, so just this is just a motivational uh, snapshot of things. There are nature papers, science papers, PRL, PRX, uh, and uh, very prominent preprints, some of them also from our team, uh, where uh, these devices, despite all their flaws, they've been used to do something interesting in quantum simulation. And as we proceed during the summer school this week, you will have some uh, understanding of what are these experiments that have been done. This will be very brief uh, shout out to the fact that the, at uh, SQMS, we do use superconducting transmond chips such as the one of Rigetti, absolutely yes. But we have also, as you've seen in the tagline before, the ambition to create a new quantum computer, which works with superconductors, but it works with something uh, which uh, uh, is called the circuit, circuit quantum electrodynamics model. The idea, the main idea is the transmon is just like one device. You can have multiple ones, but typically one is sometimes sufficient if you don't have a, like a large computer that is not used as a processing 
uh, memory or qubit for your algorithm, but is used as a nonlinear arbitrator of interactions between electromagnetic modes. Since it's a circuit, it can be capacity uh, coupled to electrical fields, for example. Now, if you focus and you confine the electrical field somewhat, for example, by a big box of superconductors, this is a cavity like the ones we, we developed at Fermilab, and then you, you can uh, start to have this circuit uh, being a, a coupler between uh, photonic modes in the, in, in, in the cavity. So the, this kind of architectures, they're called CQED architecture. You can build them also without 3D cavities, but just using 2D resonators. Now the lecture series of this virtual school of last year, uh, here at GGI, uh, featured extensive explanation of this architecture. There are four lectures by our colleague, uh, Jens Koch, and I invite you to have a look there. And uh, I think on Wednesday, you will have also some overview of what we're building at Fermilab. This is not a, a computer available yet. You cannot use it to play with, but there are other companies, not only Fermilab, which are building this kind of architectures, okay? So even from the commercial world, you will have, there's Alice and Bob, there is North Quantique, there are other companies with and AWS, which are trying to do this sort of things. Okay, let's switch gears completely, okay? Let's go to uh, neutral atoms. This is an architecture which, uh, in my view, is one of having like hell of a momentum right now, with a lot of papers in science and nature and the likes uh, showing that you can do simulations of complex systems um, uh, with the, with the, with these uh, uh, um, atoms. And um, I want just to give you very generic basic knowledge on this of this. So basically, if you take an atom which is uh, uh, neutral and you take one of the electrons of this atom and, and, and you position this electron in a bound state with a very high quantum number. So it's an orbital which is you know, n equal 100, not n equal three, four, five, you know, far away. So the, the atoms is formally actually much larger than its typical uh, ground state. Uh, it can be uh, even a micron size. I mean, a huge atom, a thousand times larger because of these electrons, which is loosely bound. Well, then if you do this and you have multiple of them around, they become interacting through Van der Waals forces, okay? And you can actually write the Hamiltonian of interaction between them. If you study Van der Waals interaction, it will go as the uh, power, sixth power inverse, the way they interact. But uh, the fun thing is that you can drive transitions between this uh, ground state, which is typically defined in the hyperfine structure, but and a Rydberg state, which is this loosely bound high state. And if you shine a laser or if, if, you, if you induce this interaction in multiple atoms at the same time, you have something which is called the Rydberg blockade, meaning that because of this Van der Waals interactions, you will have um, a radius, like a, a, a distance for which the simultaneous excitations of, of two atoms at the same time would be forbidden because you would need to give the extra energy due to their interacting energy. Uh, and so you would, uh, you would create superposition between you know, a ground state and the excited states uh, uh, entangled if you're in a situation where you do not have, um, you're within the, the blockade radius, meaning that you didn't provide this extra energy for uh, having double excited states, or you would, if you're beyond that radius, you would excite both, both atoms at the same time. Now, this kind of nice uh, rules could be exploited to do information processing, but information processing in an analog way, meaning that you have these evolutions that you can control based on the geometry of your, uh, of your atoms. Where they are located, you can essentially uh, shine lasers and make them interact following these two qualitative rules that I tell you about. And people have built processors on this. 
And uh, there are open source APIs uh, developed also by our partners, Unitary Fund. You will have a few lectures on uh, Unitary Fund work uh, during the school where, where you can build with this basic tool set, uh, interesting simulations. People have developed techniques to take these atoms and position them in 3D in uh, arbitrary shapes by using lasers which are focused and uh, you have these grids of lasers, which, uh, you know, they remind a little bit of, uh, you know, like if you're a thief trying to steal something, you have all these lasers that are, you know, uh, defining locations where the atoms uh, can stay. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, people from Paris, you know, they're very bold. They even created the Fell Tower in a paper showing that, uh, you know, these atoms can be arbitrarily shaped. So it means that you can really devise Hamiltonians that, you know, uh, follow arbitrary graphs. And then following these rules of Rydberg blockade, the Rydberg interactions, you can have interesting gates such as the XY gate or the Ising gate. And uh, I just want to shout out to two companies that have processors available online, at least, uh, uh, and, and they published papers, peer reviewed papers on their processors. There's Quera, which uh, has, uh, will, will have on AWS 256 um, uh, qubits, atoms, uh, and they promise a thousand in a couple of years. Pascal has 100 accessible here in Italy through Chineca and 300 soon and then 1,000 soon. And there's a flurry of papers that use these systems to simulate the dynamics uh, of uh, uh, spin systems through these methods that I told you about. Those are not the only two companies uh, building on neutral atoms. There are actually many more. The other two, which are uh, pretty well known, are called quantum atom computing, but they're more focused on the digital aspect of quantum computing, like the transform ones, uh, which uh, is still a little bit behind in terms of uh, number of qubits, fidelity. And so it's not really viable yet in the NISC era, as far as I understand. There are also new companies uh, in Germany coming up on this sort of methods. Ions. So you can build a quantum computer with ions, meaning uh, electrically charged atoms, which you can trap into a, a 1D uh, manifold uh, through electrodes and uh, oscillating uh, radio frequencies that keep the atoms stable at fixed distance to each other. Uh, you can typically have these atoms separated by a few microns, can arrive up to a hundred maybe, and then you start to have like, you know, second line, third line, little clouds. It starts to be a little bit messy. I think right now uh, the IonQ, which is a publicly funded company uh, that um, out of uh, University of Maryland and Duke, uh, I think they, they declared 32 qubits. I think on the cloud, you can have 15. I'm not sure, but roughly speaking, we are talking about this, these sizes of qubits. And uh, the way this works is once you have the, the atoms lined up, you do uh, shine lasers on them selectively and uh, uh, you can address them individually. Um, so by, by shining lasers on individual atoms, you can implement native gates uh, such as these ones. They kind of remind some, uh, uh, you know, X gate, for example, the GPI2. Um, the, the Z gate is typically virtualized, meaning that it's just a reference frame change in software. But And the entangling gate, the one that really gives universality, is obtained by shining lasers simultaneously in two uh, atoms in the line, and then leveraging the fact that they become displaced by nanometers and they uh, interact through dipole-dipole uh, interaction because they're charged particles. And then you have a um, optimal classical, actually classical optimal control problem in understanding how this little line vibrates uh, because it's like a guitar in some sense. And uh, you can do that in such a way that at the end of the day, uh, this is a very clean system. You have a specific gate only between these two qubits these two atoms and the others come back to the original 
uh, rest state. And this is so called the Molmer Sorensen interaction described in the physics paper of this architecture. It is a gate which has this form, it's essentially an XX interaction. Okay. And uh, uh, you can synthesize C naught out of this gate with uh, additional rotation before and after. So you have the full power of the synthesis I showed you before. You can do whatever essentially with that. Because once you have C naughts and you have single qubit rotation, you have all two qubit gates, universality. Roadmap of IMQ, it kind of changes a little bit based on earning reports and stuff, but uh, they kind of say 500 qubits in a few years. And then uh, they talk about these algorithmic qubits, which is a measure of fidelity plus qubit. Um, the nice thing about this architecture, the fidelities are the best right now among all other architectures, but the gate uh, speeds are rather slow. We're talking about tens of microseconds versus the superconductors, which are down to tens of nanoseconds, a lower fidelity. Another ion uh, company uh, is Quantinum. That's a new name. There was Honeywell Quantum Solutions. They merged with uh, Cambridge uh, Computing, Quantum Computing. Now they have a similar but different approach. They do trap the ions through the same kind of poly pole trap uh, as I, as I um, described, but instead of using vibrational motions uh, over uh, you know, a chain of qubits to, to arbitrate interactions, they decide to shuttle physically the qubits around. So you have essentially, well, in the current model, you just have like one rail, so you can just you know displace them back and forth. You define some regions of interaction, some regions of uh, wait list, right? Uh, but uh, in their new upcoming chip, they will have a loop that will be like a little bit uh, more topologically capable. And then in the roadmap, you will have multiple roads intersecting like a city. And their vision is to shuttle these ions physically using the fact that they have a charge um, and make them interact two by two in, in controlled locations where lasers shine and then the others are far away so they do not get uh, perturbed. So the, the interactions is substantially the same but the, the way they, they implement it becomes essentially an ising interaction as opposed to an XX. And they have the same gate set as the others. Um, in their latest uh, uh, in their latest chip, they have 20 qubits, and uh, um, uh, you can see that the the fidelities are very very high. I don't know if you can see from uh, from the slides, but they are over 99.9 percent. .9%. However, their gate operations times are very slow. Okay, so we're talking about uh, you know. Uh, hundreds of microseconds to execute things. Yes. I did not, but I did uh, look at the papers by, for example, JP Morgan, which is uh, you know, a user of this. They have nice features that nobody else have, like mid-circuit measurements. Like you can, because of this large time scale, you can actually measure and then you know, um, use the computation, uh, the measurement for another part of the, algorithm, which has some nice classical control feedback algorithms. Um, okay, so this is really a recap of what I just uh, presented. I mean, this is very distilled recap, but just for give you an idea, I mean, we, I discussed three architectures in very generic terms. Um, the fastest in terms of execution speed are the superconductors. Okay, we're talking about tens of nanoseconds. The highest fidelities are the ions. They reached already a point where error correction becomes you know, feasible at scale potentially, but they have scalability problems and uh, they're slow. And then uh, the, num the most number of qubits in a legitimate quantum system and quantum evolution system is through the analog approach of uh, Rydberg simulators, where you have already 300 qubits essentially working for uh, 
there are some supremacy experiments in quantum simulation because of the fact that they have 300 qubits essentially. I did not discuss other very important players in the race for quantum computing uh, at the uh, uh, application scale for arbitrary reasons, did not discuss photonics because I believe that right now there's not a product you can use on photonics for doing quantum simulations. Uh, quantum annealers, you can kind of use them for some quantum simulation in terms of like phase diagrams, so thermodynamical properties of spin system, but I feel that it's a little bit too limited for the quantum simulation field. So I do not review quantum annealers, despite they have thousands of qubits already. They're not as coherent as others approaches, at least uh, the ones implemented so far. There's approaches to use electron spins in two dimensional electron gases or on the surface of helium or in uh, um, impurities in silicon, which uh, is the Kane uh, quantum computer approach. Those are all in my view, very early stage. Although there's been a breakthrough just like a few weeks ago from a team in Australia where they showed like 10 qubit processor where you planted impurities in silicon to execute to essentially operations as an um, um, many body Hamiltonian, which is highly non-trivial, but they're very recent and not available to be used by uh, practitioners. And then topological quantum computing is even a more advanced approach, very uh, early stage where we have kind of one qubit maybe if uh, Microsoft uh, this time made their paper solid. And uh, uh, certainly something that is not yet very usable in the miscare. Okay, so I will just conclude in the next few minutes. My time is up. Uh, just want to uh, let you know if you're interested to know more about the NISCARA, the best way is to follow the papers. The, the best way to follow the papers is to read the archive because you get things on the archive months or sometimes years before they get published on nature or science or whatever journal. And I actually uh, work on a, a newsletter that every month sends a digest of all the papers I can find together with my collaborators on NISC uh, kind of approaches. So I suggest you subscribe, it's totally free and it's once a month, you get about 50 papers to look at, but you can just read the, the titles. You don't have to read them, all of them, divided by categories, depending on what you like. And also we do have a, a specialized uh, archive digest monthly again for just the superconducting uh, quantum material center. And I, I, you can subscribe to this too, where we review techniques which are more specific to circuit quantum electrodynamics uh, uh, quantum computing with qubits and, and other sort of uh, uh, interesting thing like quantum control that we care about in the center. Now, uh, you have seen the agenda. There, has been, there will be some changes that will be communicated to you, but they're not dramatic changes. Maybe something is gonna be shifted of, uh, on Wednesday and on Friday, but uh, uh, this is uh, you know the snapshot. If you just seen the table with generic, uh, titles of the sessions go on the website of GGI. We also put the name of the speakers and a little bit more details on the title of their sessions. Um, for example, on Friday, we will have specialized, very interesting cutting edge kind of discussions on quantum machine learning and quantum foundation primary field theory. And this was only listed as a research topic uh, in the original schedule. So uh, you, 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 if you have questions, you can ask me. And uh, I conclude by saying tomorrow, there's a session called student presentation. This is the point where we network. We, we kind of know each other in terms of you know each other. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll see how many people survived the, the travel, uh, but I guess we're about 34 uh, in, in attendance. So that means we have uh, about two to three minutes each. Uh, in terms of students. So um, what I would like you to prepare is, you don't have to prepare any slide, you just you know, show up here and uh, uh, you present yourself to the rest of the audience. You're going to say, where are you, where you come from? What is your study path so far? What are you researching, studying right now? Why you wanted to attend this school? 
and what you hope to get out of this school for your uh, future. And then maybe just for the fun of it, just say hobby or an interesting adventure happening, happening to you, that happened to you. All within two minutes. So it needs to be rehearsed. Okay, that's uh, the homework. And I think with this, I'm at time, exactly on time. So maybe there might be a time for questions, but we have also the entire lunch to have questions. Thank you for your attention.